Hi, I'm David. I'm the owner of, of Griffith Research Limited, and I'm going to be talking about um, Next PNR kind of a year on from when it was introduced last year at, at the last OrConf. So Next PNR is a pretty new tool. Uh, development started in, in May 2018, but it's been very actively developed in that, sh in that time. We've already had um, contributions from 29 people, which is, which is pretty impressive. And um, it's a multi-architecture uh, place and route tool. It's aimed at real-world FPGAs, um, including the advanced functionality in those FPGAs. And um, it, it describes architectures using code rather than, say, um, XML files, which gets you a lot of flexibility for, for the intricacies of real-world FPGAs. It's timing-driven, unlike some of the older tools like Arachne PNR. And um, it has a Python API which allows extensibility and experimentation without having to really modify the C++ or spend a lot of time on implementations. So this is just a, a rough overview of the ecosystem that's built up around NextPNR now. So we have uh, synthesis, synthesis coming in from Yosis. We use Yosis's JSON format for netlist. It's, but um, Yosis can also go into other place and root tools using older formats. And then we can use iStorm, Trellis, X-Ray, RapidWrite. All these routes are ways of generating bit streams for the different devices that NextPNR supports. So um, some of the things that have happened since, since last, last OrConf, we've um, improved the timing analysis to get multiple clock domains. We've added support for the advanced I.O. hardware in the ECP5 for things like DDR memory. Uh, we've replaced the simulated annealing placer with a faster analytical placer. I'll talk about that a bit more in a, in a bit. Um, I've also been working on faster multi-threaded um, timing analysis. That's not quite upstream yet, but that was my part of my university master's project. And that should be an another performance improvement for bigger designs. Um, Another more experimental feature, which is upstream, and I have a few examples of now, is pre-place and rooted macros. So if, for example, you have a big system on chip and you're only changing one peripheral, you don't have to replace and root the whole system on chip. Um, whenever that peripheral changes, you can just change part of the design and keep up the rest of it fixed. Um, and very recently, we've also gained experimental support for two Xilinx devices, um, Arctic 7 via Project X-Ray and the newer Ultrascale Plus via uh, RapidWrite, which is a project by Xilinx, to add open interfaces to Vivado. So analytical placement, what's that about? The traditional FPGA placement algorithm is simulated annealing, which is really just extended trial and error and making a lot of moves and seeing what's a bit like throwing mud at a wall and seeing what sticks, really. And actually, it gives really, really good quality of results if you let it run long enough. But it does get very, very slow when you have big designs on big FPGAs. And it's not even that good at small designs on big FPGAs. It's quite good at small, small designs on small FPGAs, though. Um, analytical placement, on the other hand, is generally based around solving a system of equations to come up with, a, with a, an optimum placement, or um, a, as optimal as you can get anyway. Um, the algorithm we've chosen is based on um, heap. It's a bit of an unfortunate name because it's um, a rather common computer science term, but um, heterogeneous analytical placer by Marcel Gort and Jason Anderson, if you want to Google the paper. Um, so um, some of the modifications we made, made to this algorithm is that traditional FPGA placement, um, first of all, packs logic elements into tiles and then just places those tiles. To get more flexibility in Next PNDAR, we, um, we, 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 we don't do so much packing and we, pack logic we place logic elements individually um, without first packing them into tiles, but that adds more constraints onto the placement because you have to consider things like shared clock signals. So that was one of the main modifications that we had to make to that algorithm. But once we got it working, the results were really, really worthwhile. This is um, runtime. The blue on the top is, is, is the old simulated annealing placer. Um, that on the bottom is the new analytical placer. And that's actually a logarithmic scale. So we were sort of 50 times faster on some designs. So it was a really, really big runtime improvement with um, no real reduction in, reduction in quality. So it was, a, it was a big step forward for, for bigger ECP5 designs in particular. 
Likewise, the ECP5 support last year is a real proof of concept. Now it's going to be something that you can really, really use for complex designs. So we have almost all the core features supported, even things like the high-speed transceivers, DSPs, PLLs. We can build designs like DDR3 controllers, like DRAM, gigabit Ethernet, HDMI video, um, even, the, even the five PCI Express. Um, the only thing that's stopping a full PCI Express link really is, is, is the open source IP not being complete. And um, we've got demos running 32-bit and 64-bit RISC-V Linux socks, and um, just so no one's left out, open RISC socks too. And um, White Quark and I recently worked together on getting um, partial reconfiguration working on ECP5s, even though um, partial reconfiguration isn't actually something that the vendors officially support, so that was quite fun. So these, these are the kind of things you can do. This is an ECP5 development board, booting Linux with a graphical frame buffer, uh, two DDR3 memory trips, Ethernet, and this was all, all built using, using the open source tools. And um, light, IP calls most, mostly from Litex with the Vexrus 5 processor. So um, more recently, in order to stretch the algorithms even further and see what we need to work on next, I've been looking at some experimental uh, Xilinx flows using Next and R2. So we have um, two proof of concept demos that can now be built using these flows. So this isn't really an end user ready flow, and I think the the main Symbi flow work using VPR will probably be the more end user ready flow for the time being. But this is an interesting way to experiment with algorithms. Um, and we support a reasonable number of primitives, so we can do things like um, a light DRAM DDR4 controller on the UltraScale Plus on a ZCU104 board, and the Vexrus 5 Linux demo on an, on an RT board. Um, so that, that gives you an idea that we support um, not just the logic, but also some of the I.O. and RAM primitives. We don't have DSPs yet. Um, there are a few more fundamental limitations that we need to work on first, like the fact that timing, timing data for these devices we're not really importing properly yet, and the routing is, is fairly slow compared to the ICE-40 and ECP-5 devices because Xilinx are a bit more clever in how they design their devices. The routing matrix is sparser, but um, the, the downside of that is that means you need more advanced routing algorithms to be able to route efficiently for these FPGAs. Um, this work isn't yet upstream because it's quite experimental, but that's the URL if you, if you want to take a look at, look at what's going on here. So just to go into a bit more detail about the two different pathways that we have for Xilinx. So RapidWrite is, is the open project by Xilinx to enable you to get your own designs into Vivado, get device data out of Vivado, and it's a really cool project. Um, this has given us the ability to do custom place and route for UltraScale Plus without having to do any kind of bitstream documentation or anything, any of the dirty work like that. And it also gets you um, a lot more reliable infrastructure because you then only have to debug your place and route. You don't have to worry about debugging things like bitstream generation or timing analysis. Um, but some people also want fully open source flows for various reasons, so we've also got proof of concepts working with, with Project X-Ray um, for the 7 series. And um, in both cases, even with X-Ray, we, we're currently using RapidWrite for the device database in both cases, but perhaps in the future we could look at bringing the database from X-Ray into NextP and R2. So looking at the things that we want to work on going forward, some of the things I plan to play with, um, the biggest one, personally, is, um, is a new router for NextP and DAR, as I mentioned, both for better support for Xilinx FPGAs and even very congested designs on ECP5 and ICE-40 can hit the limitation of the current router. The router is limiting timing performance too, so with a new router we can do things like timing-driven rerouting, rip up nets that are failing timing and reroute them better, um, and maybe looking at more innovative algorithmic approaches to routing, like using SAT solvers um, when we hit cases of very hard congestion that really need a lot of thinking as to how to resolve them in an uncongested way. And routing is a fairly local problem, unlike placement, so you can pick uh, wires that have bounding boxes that don't overlap and then route them separately on different threads. So that's another scope for a, a performance improvement in routing. Uh, the other thing for more complicated designs, more complicated devices, particularly with, um, with the hack we found for ECP5, is better infrastructure for partial reconfiguration, support for, support for 
blocks in the design, better better front end for the JSON that supports hierarchy, all the stuff we need for, for proper partial reconfiguration using NextPNDAR. And then finally, it would be really nice to see more integration with the other SymbiFlow projects, particularly as we get on to supporting things like Xilinx and maybe if SymbiFlow also work on other Xilinx devices to share some of the work. So looking at file formats that are shared between the two, ways of using the Python API to integrate the two, and perhaps similar to a way that VPR XML is currently generated from Verilog, perhaps using Verilog or something in that ecosystem to generate some of the code that NextPNDAR uses in architect some of the architecture specific code in NextPNDAR for things like um, validity checking, which is really our equivalent of packing and clustering in, in VPR. So there's a lot of work forward. There are a lot of ways you can help too. So actually the first thing you can do is just play about with NextPNDAR, use it, report any bugs you find. Bug reports are always welcome, however stupid you think you're being. You should never say be seeing an assertion failure when it should be a proper error. Um, if you want to play a bit more, perhaps you have some interesting non-standard use cases where the Python API would be a really good fit. Um, maybe then you can start looking at bugs that are there and you can fix. Um, and then that maybe that's a gateway into implementing new CAD algorithms in NextPNDAR or adding some more architectures. Perhaps you want to look at um, some of the newer FPGAs coming through the system, uh, some of the Chinese brands, Intel, whatever. And that's our GitHub link. And uh, if you want to join in a kind of chat, the two channels on Freenode that are quite active, Hashash Open FPGA or Hashiosis. And um, Finally, you can also support me personally in the development of NextPNDAR, so I'm just launching a Patreon. I, I launched it this afternoon, and I'm very, very grateful to the people that have already supported, but supporting this will allow me to put more time personally into developing some of these things further in NextPNDAR. Thank you, Dave, for doing uh, all this uh, placing around. Uh, I was um, wondering if you saw uh, VMware Cascade project, which is uh, a JIT compiler, which uh, takes very log and off, like analyze it and uh, put part of it in uh, FPG, like in FPG, and re real time. Uh, they do it on Altera, but it's kind of super slow on their flow. I was wondering how next PNR can can be faster. Yes, yeah, so I think um, uh, someone I'm working with, Eddie Hung, has been looking a bit at, uh, or was looking a bit at getting Yosis and next PNR into Cascade, but that will hopefully become even more relevant once we have better support for for partial builds for for macros and things. So yeah, that would definitely be something very interesting because I think tightening the development loop, closing the loop, building things fast, incremental builds is is really interesting. Um, for development because simulation is really cool and often the best way to develop things quickly but if you're interfacing with odd hardware and things sometimes it's really nice just to be able to create new bit streams as fast as possible can you say more about macros or point us to where we can find out more um let me just oh, i'll put something on on, on github tonight or on the on the next pnr github i'll put a link to that but Thank you for reminding me on that one. But um, the idea is basically that you, I've, I've got an example of it somewhere that I'll link to, but basically you place and root most of your design. Um, you then f write a JSON file from NextPNDAR that contains most of your design. You um, then use that JSON file as a pre-place and rooted module in a bigger design. Um, in Yosis, and then that creates another JSON file that goes back into NextPNDAR. But it's probably much quicker explained with, with a with a make file example than than with me trying to explain it now. I have a question. You uh, mentioned that uh, so currently NextPNDAR sort of barely handles like the large ECP5 chips, which are like 50 something k lots. Uh, how do you see uh, NextPNDAR evolving to handle like FPGAs that are 10 times bigger, basically? 
So, um, so long as the design's not congested, I mean, so, so they're basically, so the biggest East Perth is like 85K, and it's absolutely fine up to about 85, 90% usage on one of those. It, it, the problem going to Xilinx is not even the size of the devices, but, um, but the, the different routing matrix, really. And it's not catastrophically slow. It's often not that much slower than Vivado, even. It's just the bigger problem is that it's much slower compared to, say, an uncongested ECP5 design. And... The, the place is already scaling pretty well. The place is scaling is, is, is linear up to about a million LUTs. So the place that I'm very happy with, but it, it's just the routing now that, that, that's the remaining problem in terms of scalability. And the current route is a pretty, pretty simple algorithm, and there's a lot of work out there on negotiating around congestion better that, that should improve that a lot. Uh, is the plan for this project specifically related to like new technologies like UltraScale Plus um, to be performance competitive with something like Vivado? And if so, can you share uh, sort of where you're at or where you want to be along that process? So I think um, right now we aim to be runtime, certainly better, better. We, we really aim to beat the vendor tools in terms of runtime, but not necessarily quality at the moment. So ECP5, which is relatively mature, we usually end up about 10, 20% 10, 20 behind in terms of frequency, but maybe 30, 40% faster. So that's the kind of current trade-off where NextP and R is at the moment. And going forward, that's where we'd also like to be for, for things like UltraScale. So let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>